Rosa Clemente is a leading scholar on Afro-Latinx identity and the anti-racist struggles of the 60s and 70s. Also an activist and political organizer, she's led political tours, built radical organizations, and much more. Among many accolades, she was selected for Ebony Magazine's list of top 100 most inspiring African Americans, and was the 2008 Green Party candidate for vice president. I sat down with Rosa at the People's Congress of Resistance in Washington, D.C. to talk about third party politics and organizing in the Trump era. Rosa, you worked as an aide in the Democratic Party for years, up until 2000, if I'm not mistaken. What made you leave the Democratic Party and embrace more revolutionary politics? So I was part of that radical black, Latino left of colleges that was every day having a protest or rally demanding something. So I knew the flaws of the Democratic Party. So I was never like, you know, I would obviously vote and was voting as a Democrat. But then I saw Ralph Nader speak in upstate New York. And at that time he was with the Green Party. And I was like, oh, how don't I know that there's another party? Like, how am I in any way involved in electoral politics and don't know that there's more than two parties? But really the turning point for me was in 2005 when I went down to report on what's happening right after Hurricane Katrina and the levee breach in New Orleans. And the minute I saw what was going on, I was obviously mad at George Bush and the response from the government but began to talk to a lot of people and how they felt the Democratic Party just in general had been letting them down. So it kind of like gave me a focus of looking at the Democratic Party from a very critical lens. And then um, in 2006, I registered and became a Green Party member. And then in 2008, you ran as the vice presidential candidate, Cynthia McKinney, as the presidential candidate, two women of color the first time. Yeah. right in history i voted for you i was so proud to do so i told everyone to do Thank so you. um what was the biggest takeaway or lesson learned from that whole experience and what backlash if any did you get from the democrats greens progressives for kind of infringing on obama's presidency as the first person of color i always tell people i believe if two men of color had been the nominees there still there would have been more support for those men of color Patriarchy, misogyny, sexism was rampant for many circles. Um, me and Cynthia didn't work for almost two years after we ran. Nobody would really hire us. And of course we were told, especially by a lot of black and Latinos that were heavily involved with the Democratic Party that we were basically traitors and we were making the worst mistakes of our lives. And I was told by some of my mentors that I was destroying any ability to have any type of career afterwards. Is also as a historian, I'm a trained historian in black studies and Africana studies, I knew the significance of Barack Obama. I just wanted people to also respect the significance of two women of color a Afro-Latina, a Puerto Rican, and an African-American and what that meant. Because I knew the significance of when Obama won. And I myself that night took a moment to watch him and Michelle and Sasha Malia go and know this is a historical moment. But history doesn't make movements like that. The people make the movement. And that was a moment and it wasn't a movement. Barack Obama was never a movement. And I, I felt like that from that time. And I think history has proved a lot of what me and Cynthia did to be the right thing. Um, lastly, we, there's a lot of racism in the Green Party from a lot of white men in that party. And the Colorado State Green Party took us off the ballot. So I think people have to understand the significance of what it means to take your own candidates off the ballot because you think they're too radical. We saw two mass movements arise under the Obama administration, despite, you know, people can criticize the progressive movement for, for failing, the anti-war movement for dying, but really you cannot discount Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. You know, what does that mean? I, I mean, looking back on his legacy, what significance did it have and what space did you think it carved for kind of 
that those sort of grassroots mobilization? You know, I'm sure by day two or three, the police had infiltrated Wall Street as well as began to do the tactics of the counterintelligence program, which is create disruption and discord. Then with Black Lives Matter, what predates Black Lives Matter, though, is important, is then you have young people that are undocumented that are seeing that the Barack Obama administration and the Democrats, along with Cecilia Munoz, who was the director of domestic policy, ratcheted up deportations. So you begin to see young people saying undocumented, unafraid. That was before even the DREAM Act was in the kind of zeitgeist. And then what we see under black president is the rise of Black Lives Matter. And I, I often think of it too, historically, would Black Lives Matter have risen if it hadn't been a black president? I think so, but I think the impact wouldn't have been as great. Because you, at this point, those black young people, whether they're um, the Ferguson frontline resistors or those that were part of Black Lives Matter after it became not just a hashtag, had seen Troy Davis executed and had seen Trayvon Martin's killer walk free. And they were also those that voted for Obama the first time they could vote. And they were deeply upset and disappointed, I think, at him. Like, you're the black president and this is happening. There are things you can actually do and you're not choosing to do them. And then what we saw in Ferguson was queer folks, but it was also really what we call street organizations, the young brothers and sisters that people call gangs, we call them sets, that said, nah, Michael Brown's death won't be in vain. And we, if we have to throw rocks like our Palestinian brothers and sisters are doing at military tanks, we're gonna do that. So I think it was a, you know, a, combina a culmination of all of it, but particularly the disappointment that African American and Latino young people specifically felt who had helped President Obama become the president. You know, even this year, uh, Rosa, with the two most hated, detestable candidates, you know, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, a reality star game show host. Um, narcissist, misogynist, racist, uh -huh. um, and, and you can go on all day about Maybe Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> Jill Stein barely broke that million vote. I don't understand it. I mean, I really, really thought that this time I was like, well, you know, clearly with these two hated candidates, Jill Stein's at least going to get three million, maybe five percent of the vote. I was pretty surprised. And then you see the non-votes. Uh -huh. Almost twice as many people in these swing states went out, voted for everything, and left president blank. Right. That's incredible. Yeah. So then there's the shaming of people still blaming people who voted for Jill Stein, yeah. of course, on Trump, which, which is insane. Is, yeah. But why do you think there was such a poor turnout for Greens? We had too many Green Party people that were trying to sway Bernie Sanders to come up the way. What the Green Party should have been doing is going to half of the population that doesn't vote in any election. Don't try to change a Democrat. Don't try to go after a Trump supporter. Don't even go after Bernie Sanders. Why don't you go after the 50 so percent of people that are not voting in this country? We know where they're at. We have the statistics to, we could look at all the data to say, this is where we need to be. And I think the Green Party made a mistake by almost chasing after Bernie and Hillary and Trump, even though this was the year that we got the most mainstream media coverage. I mean, to have Jill Stein and Ajamu Baraka on a CNN stage and see no results from that means that then the party has to be very either introspective or that people of color, especially young people, may have to form their own new political party if they want to be part of electoral politics. But even with all that said, we're not going after the people who are not voting. Instead, many people, as you say, shame them as opposed to saying, why are you not voting? Mm -hmm. What would make you vote? What does leadership in your community look like? I don't know if the Green Party is going to be able to recover 
from the narrative that takes us back to 2000, that it was Ralph Nader's fault. And now the idea that less than 1% of people that voted for Jill Stein is the reason that Trump won, as opposed to always being very clear that the narrative is Trump won because 52% of white women in this country voted for white supremacy instead of themselves. They voted for patriarchy instead of their own liberation. And how do we have those real and deep and honest conversations with people that are not existential conversations and really academic conversations, but true grassroots conversations? Um, I guess just talk more about the trappings of, of Bernie Sanders as a whole and, and the whole democratic socialism movement. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, like Americans are always looking for someone to save them. They're either looking for someone to save them or an authority figure to tell them what to do. Yeah, when it comes to Bernie Sanders and Democratic Socialists of America, I had to ask did any socialist, like, did he run as a socialist or did he run as a Democrat? He's made his choice. Now, I'm not saying, uh, in fact, Bernie Sanders was in Albany during a camp, uh, campaign stop. And he actually met with Black Lives Matter Upstate, which I helped uh, found, and met with the family of a victim of police murder by the name of Dante Ivey. And I mean, we were there for a good, like 40 minutes. And talking to him, of course I see, he is not like the rest of these people. Mm -hmm. But he has his blind spot. He thinks the Democratic Party can be pushed. It's never going to be pushed to that. And, and I just don't understand how they don't see what the majority of us are seeing and why Bernie Sanders wouldn't have taken the step forward to say, wait a minute, I'm going to run as a third party candidate. I mean, obviously not, he wasn't going to run as a Green. Then run as a socialist or figure out how we do that line or how it is that you're independent. So I think it, the draft Bernie people, the folks that think he's gonna run again, I don't think he is, but are looking for literally someone to save them at this moment of crisis. And electoral politics never saved anyone. I always look at Africans who were enslaved in this country. Not one of them voted to be free. They organized to be free, knowing that their freedom might not come, but their children's freedom was definitely coming. And I think sometimes in our movement spaces, whether they're progressive, left, radical, socialist, um, new African, Puerto Rican independence, that we often don't look at the psychology and the psychosis that some, a lot of people are going through that essentially say, either save me or tell me what to do. Because I got two jobs, I got to pay my rent, I don't have health care, I'm formally incarcerated, I don't have my prescription benefits, college, debt, that's a privilege for some of us to have college debt when people can't pay their rent. And, you know, that's what happens sometimes. And I think that's where we're at right now in this country, like, you know, kind of mass social control kind of way. Is there viability right now to build a new third party? You know, I would have said a couple years ago, maybe, but I think now the electoral political system is so, corrupt is not even the right word. It's so driven by money, obviously. Citizens United, I think, dealt a huge blow to what that looks like. And to form a third party that can get on the ballot, the reason the Green Party is still critically important as well is because Greens know how to get on a ballot. Hmm. I don't think people understand the mechanisms of what it means to run and get on a ballot. I think there's an assumption, Rosa's running, I'm on a ballot. No. And then people don't realize that oftentimes the Democrats and Republicans will come together to keep off any third party. So in a sense, they could keep switching power on and off. Four years, eight years, here, your turn, right? Ballot access. The fact that to run a New York City Council race in the 80s would have cost 10, 15,000 dollars. 
you can't even run for New York City Council if you don't have $250,000 already probably pledged, right? Look at our senators. I mean, we're talking Senate races that are now going in tens of millions of dollars. Who can do that? The only way you raise that money is what? Do corporations. So I don't know at this point if on the federal level we're going to ever see a third party candidate. I do believe on the local level, that's a whole different ball game if it's a smaller city and a smaller municipality. I don't know if we should be now putting all our efforts into that. And that's lastly one thing that I'm very concerned about. I, I don't like going into spaces where people are talking about who's running in 2018 or 2020. It's like what's happening right now and what work can we do to basically have communities that are localized self-determining and can defend themselves from what we know is about to happen with the Trump administration, which on its face is gonna be most likely massive amounts of roundups. And if we can't stop roundups and people from being deported, I don't know if we can get to the point of starting a third party in this country, uh, another other third parties. I mean, great point. I mean, let's just analyze what we're looking at right now. We have the J-20 arrests of over 200 people mm -hmm. facing life in prison for being in the vicinity of a broken window. We have the Trump regime ramming so much down our throats. It's so hard to, like, figure out where where to focus our energy. And then you have the Democratic Party, of course, co-opting the resistance, right? Even Hillary Clinton using Heather Hare's name yeah. to try to get money. She also threw Black Lives Matter under the bus in her book. <laughs> What'd she, you say? Well, in, in her book, she said that Black Lives Matter would be great if they had a policy platform. And then I'm like, so you didn't read the, you didn't read the movement for Black Lives Policy Platform that took a year to be created from over 40 groups that are mostly young people of color, queer-led groups that gave you every solution to every problem on a website and have been for the last year infusing what is called the Movement for Black Lives Platform into all the work, right? So, it, 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 and it doesn't help also that Bernie Sanders and all his people are talking about identity politics as something that our identities are something that we shouldn't be talking about. When Trump won on identity politics, he ran on a white identity politic and won. But then we're being told as people of color not to bring all of who we are into the space. It's a disgusting contradiction. Yeah. I'll say specifically that type of mainstream media and some liberals and so-called progressives have also normalized it. Like, let's give them a chance. Look, I think Sh Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi just meeting with him last week and then walking out and saying, we got a deal on DACA. And then six hours later, he tweeted, he's like, what deal are they talking about? Why are they walking in a room with him? <laughs> Why are you even giving, it, it was almost like at the State of the Union, I said, there were two Congress people that didn't go, right? Luis Gutierrez and Maxine Waters. My whole thing was, why was any Democrat sitting at any State of the Union? Because you believe in the institution to the point that you want to save it, but maybe it's no longer savable. But what you're essentially doing is you have helped normalize this behavior, which could actually lead to another Trump presidency. And I think it might, because that's I, how tone deaf these people are. Rosa. Because his base is his, no joke. They're gonna ride, like we say in hip hop, they are riding and dying with Donald Trump to, and what we've seen is the Democratic Party failing, maybe even some third parties that should be doing better failing, so we might see less people of color, less marginalized people that would be usually inclined to be independent or Democratic, maybe voting in this next election. And then obviously last, we always have the Republican Party spot on with voter suppression. And you know, not only this this uh, vitriolic repression, yeah. um, you know, undocumented people, trans people, everyone's under attack. That's mm -hmm. a minority or queer. So I feel like we're seeing a twofold effect. Organizing is getting stronger, but then maybe the people on the front lines who are at risk maybe right. are pulling back. I mean, how do we deal with this apparent contradiction? And, and what will organizing look like? Do you, do you think it will look like under Trump? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question that I, I, that I don't have the answer yeah. to because what's also happening is what Jeff Sessions is doing with the Department of Justice. And I think that's the quiet, maybe not quiet for us, but that's really what we should be talking about. Like, you have Jeff Sessions basically saying he wants a new war on drugs. There will be no crimes prosecuted, no police misconduct. And not that the Department of Justice really ever comes back with anything to, uh, to say that police officers have violated rights. You have someone like Betsy DeVos that is now saying that we have to think about the rapists on campus and that they're not thrown under a bus where you've had a 10 year movement of young women on campus and their male allies, not only being brave enough to tell their stories, but suing the federal government under Title IX violations. So while the Trump clown factory is what we see every day, then what's happening to departments? You don't have time to think about how do we have an underground system that's not going to rely on Twitter or Facebook to tell our stories when the government decides like whatever or an algorithm changes mm -hmm. and then you don't know what's happening and I mean we could look at mainstream media and even some progressive media that are obsessed to the point of Trumpism that they don't tell any other stories of resistance so when you don't even see that within the progressive media and the, the obsession with Russia, mm -hmm. it's just like, I don't know what organizing looks like right now on a mass level. I know that what I'm seeing on a local level is literally people just trying right now to survive. And I spoke about that earlier. We're like in survival mode and not thriving mode. But usually out of these moments comes a new group of people, usually young people. And what I think we're gonna see is my daughter's generation, so my daughter's 12 and I would say to like the 21, 22 year olds, are gonna be faced with such a crisis that they're gonna have to figure out um, a new way of how we do the work and what organizing looks like and what movement building looks like. And you're a firm believer in building those organizations that can serve as a political home, yes. not just the protest politics, not just fighting in the streets. There mm -hmm. has to be something larger. Expand more on Political education is key. And I, I think we have a lot of people that are organizers and activists that are still not have political education. And what I mean by that is it's as, as simple as dedicating yourself to making sure you're watching the most progressive media um, going to those spaces where there's the Empire Files or, um, and I mix what I like, or a Black Agenda Report, to actually see the nuances and real, still deep, like investigative narrative storytelling of the people, the others that are the most marginalized. I think it's like that. I also think it's about reading history and understanding that we've been here before. America is founded on the genocide of indigenous people, the enslavement of African people, the exploitation of immigrant people. We've had bans before, mass deportations before, and people say that will never happen again. And it's literally happening now. I think history is super instructive. I don't think history as much repeats itself as it stays on a continuum. And so I think it's important that if you're new into this movement work, that you sit down and study, that you talk to elders who've done the work, but also the elders who will admit the mistakes that they did. So those are not repeated. So Rosa, what is your message to young people um, under 20 or you know just getting involved in political activism? What's your message to them? Toni Morrison ha did a speech a couple years ago at UMass Amherst. And she said, never see yourself through the white gaze. And that has stuck with me. Because I think, especially for young people of color, sometimes what young people of color is seeking is the same system that is seeking to destroy them, to edify them, 
to say you're doing a good job. You're good. I like what you're saying. Usually when that happens, you're not doing a good job. And you can't lastly expect that all your work is always visible and awarded or rewarded. Carter G. Woodson, the father of African American history, never got one award in his life. He was never on a magazine cover, <laughs> you know. You have to be okay with being on the margins. Like, I feel like I was born on the margins and I'm always gonna be there. And young people who are doing movement work are gonna have to kind of get through that too. You might be born on the margins, you're never gonna be normal, and you'll probably die on the margins. But those of us that do that work, history will always tell the truth and will always reward that work.